All right, Revelation chapter 17 and 18. If you remember back in chapter 14, uh, the Lord sent forth three angels in chapter 14. Chapter 14, verse 6, the first angel, it says, was going around the earth proclaiming the everlasting gospel to every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. Throughout the world, he's telling people, turn to Christ, repent of your sins before it's too late. This is in the midst of the Great Tribulation. God does not want to see people destroyed. And then he sends a second angel, and in chapter 14, verse 8, the second angel is warning people, and, and he says, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. In, in other words, Babylon the great will be destroyed during the great tribulation. And it's here in chapter 17 and 18, the apostle John is given great insights into uh, chapter 17 deals with spiritual Babylon, all the false spiritual things in the world uh, and their destruction. Chapter 18 deals with all the material, political, economic garbage of this world that God will deal with and destroy. And so this chapter in, in, that we'll look at first, um, the Lord comes against this false religious system. Now keep in mind, that this system that we're going to look at is what is left behind after the rapture of the church. So after the bride of Christ, the true believers are gone, there's going to be this void that will quickly be filled by this guy known as the false prophet, and he will create this one world religion. We saw in chapter 13, he'll get all the world to worship the Antichrist, the beast, thinking he's the Messiah, but he is the false Messiah. He's the Antichrist. And so multitudes who are left behind will be unified under this one world religious system that will be overseen by the Antichrist and the false prophet. So um, let's pick up here in chapter 17, verse 1. Then, now we left off in chapter 16 seeing the Battle of Armageddon. That's the end of the Great Tribulation. But now again, we're given insights into what's taking place here. Then one of the seven angels who had... The seven bulls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So this great harlot sits on many waters. You know, this is a lot of symbolism here, but we're told exactly what this means. Look at verse 15 of chapter 17. It says, then he uh, said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And so this woman, this religious system, has influence over all the world. People everywhere, they're drunk or they're intoxicated with her harlotry and her fornication, it says. And throughout scriptures, these terms uh, equate to idolatry. Worshipping God in unprescribed ways. Worshipping God through idols. Changing the, the image of the one true living God into an image made like man or animals or whatever they, you know, conform God into being what they want him to be rather than worshipping the God of the Bible. So it says in verse 3, So he, this angel, carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Now, we'll see very quickly that this woman is being supported by the beast. So she's riding this beast. This is the false religious system, this woman. And riding on the beast, the Antichrist. She thinks she's in control, but we'll see at the end of this chapter, the beast is going to turn on this woman, this false religious system, and devour her, destroy her. So this is speaking of the Antichrist. This is exactly how he's described in chapter 13, verse 1. Both here and in chapter 13, the Antichrist is said to have seven heads, ten horns, and we'll see the interpretation of that here in a moment. Verse 4. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. So here we see this false religious system is very wealthy, 
Purple and scarlet were the colors of the Roman Empire, and purple and scarlet in the 4th century would become the colors of the Church of Rome. And so a lot of commentators, they see the Roman Catholic Church in this scene here. But once again, this is, the, this is those who are left behind. So we don't want to just pick on the Roman Catholic Church. This will be people from every church who are not born again. People from every church who have rejected Jesus Christ as the one true Messiah who have changed Jesus into their own image and likeness. So this apostate church will, ha will only have the outward appearance of beauty and wealth, but inwardly God sees the wickedness and the filthiness of her fornication. Anytime a religion emphasizes the outward appearance above the inward heart, that's an abomination in God's eyes. God is always concerned about your heart first and foremost. He changes us from the inside out. Religion tries to change people, conform people from the outside. You got to do this. You got to do that. You can't do these things. But Jesus works in our heart and he changes our attitudes. He changes our desires and, and he works from the inside out. Now, the outward appearance, it's an abomination in the eyes of the Lord if the heart isn't right. This is what Jesus says in Matthew 23, verse 27. Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. These were the religious leaders in Jesus' day, calling them hypocrites. For you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones, and all uncleanness. And that's what we see with this woman here. Look at verse 5. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of, uh, and of the abominations of the earth. So Babylon the mother of harlots is where you can trace back the birth of pretty much all false doctrines, false religions, godly godless practices. It's where Satan, working through Nimrod and his wife Semiramis, tried to deceive mankind into thinking that, you know, you can follow pagan religion. You can follow alternate ways to worship God. And this is where it was born in Babylon. Uh, Semiramis claimed to have given birth miraculously and her son, Tammuz, she claimed to be a Messiah. Now, this goes back to the Garden of Eden, Genesis 3.15, when God tells the serpent, who deceived Adam and Eve, that the seed would be born of the woman, which is against nature, but the seed would be born of the woman, and he, the seed, would crush the serpent's head. That's Jesus crushing Satan. And the serpent would bruise his heel. That took place on the cross. Well, from that time, Satan has always tried to deceive and distort God's word. And so he raises up Semiramis and then his wife, uh, or not his wife, Semiramis and her child, Tammuz. And there's ancient images of this mother-child goddess and the child. And it took place also in Egypt, where you would have Isis and her little child, Horus. The Canaanites had Ashtoreth and Baal. The Romans had Venus and the little child, Cupid. You see that little image of Cupid with the darts? I mean, that's from the Roman Empire. The Greeks had Eros and Ap Aphrodite. But they were all the same. There were this woman and the little child who was supposed to be this Messiah-type figure. So Satan is trying to distort the true image of who Jesus Christ is. The Catholic Church obviously has Mary, and then you see all these images of the baby Jesus. Well, the baby grew up. He's no longer on the cross. The baby grew up, the Messiah, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And so he's still not a baby. He's not, you know, cute and mild and little child in the manger. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Well, look at verse 6. It says, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. So a horrible picture is painted here 
that this false religious system is drunk on the blood of God's saints. This will never be more apparent than during the Great Tribulation because we've seen already that the Antichrist will come against all those who refuse to take the mark of the beast, his mark, 666. He will have them killed, those who reject the, the lies of the Antichrist, who turn to Jesus during the Great Tribulation, will primarily be put to death for their faith. And it's no secret God's genuine followers have always faced persecution. And it's also no secret that most of the time, this persecution of God's people have come from other religious people. Religion is the cause of almost every single war that's ever been waged in this world. Um, Muslims love to kill infidels, but they've killed many times more. Who? Muslims. The Shia and the Sunnis hate each other, and they've killed millions of their fellow you know, Muslims because religion is Satan's trick to try to deceive people into killing and destroying. And we're superior to you, and so we'll prove we're superior by killing you off. And that's, it happens all the time. Satan was behind the Roman Catholic Inquisitions, where they would round up and slaughter multitudes of Bible-believing Christians. Why? Because they refused to say, you know, that the Pope is the only true authority, they, they believed and read the Bible for themselves, and that was anathema at that time to the Catholic Church. And so they slaughtered godly men and women because they trusted the Bible only and not the Church of Rome. Babylonian birth pagan religion, religions were constantly trying to annihilate God's chosen people, the Jews, for about 4,000 years now. So God will, you know, godly people have always been persecuted by religious systems. And that's what we see here. This is a religious system that is anti-God. It says here in verse 7, But the angel said to me, Why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not, and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel, whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they see the beast that was, and is not, and yet is. I hope that clarified it for you. <laughs> um, Again, the beast here is the Antichrist. Anytime you see the word the beast, that's the Antichrist. Uh, we saw back in chapter 13 why the world was worshiping the Antichrist because three times in chapter 13 it says the Antichrist was put to death but was miraculously healed or raised up. His deadly wound was healed. Uh, we know it's in chapter 13 that it says that Satan fully at that time fully possesses the Antichrist. And it says Satan gives him all of his power, all of his authority and his throne. And so we see that phrase used time and time again. It's also where we see this phrase that there are those whose names are not written in the book of life, the Lamb's book of life. It's no mystery to God whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life because God is omniscient. He knows all things. He knows from eternity past who's going to receive him and who's going to reject him. So that doesn't mean that he sat there eons ago and just pushed a button and said, okay, you guys are all toast. You guys are going to come in. That's not a, the love of God. He desires none to perish, but all to come to repentance. So he gives us a free will. He created us, the sovereign God, with the free will to choose. You want to receive him or reject him? If you want to know if your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life and you're not sure, then you need to just humble yourself and say, Lord, I need you to be my Lord and Savior. I'm a sinner. I cannot save myself. I can't wash my sins away. I need you, Jesus, and he will come into your life. He will forgive you. And he'll give you eternal life. And you can know where you're going. You can know that you have the free gift of eternal life. The same Apostle John who wrote the book of Revelation tells us this in 1 John 5, starting in verse 11. And this is the testimony that God 
has given us eternal life, and notice, and this life is in his Son. That's the only place you're going to find eternal life. Not in trying to keep the Ten Commandments. Not in trying to keep the, you know, 613 laws the Jews came up with. Not in trying to be a good person. The only place you're going to find life is in Him, in Jesus. Right? So you'll find this life in Him. He who has the Son, that's Jesus Christ, has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Very simple. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. So he wants you to know that you have eternal life. He wants you to know where you're going to go when you die. He wants you to know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So I know where I'm going when I die into the presence of the Lord. And it's not because of anything I've done, because I've done nothing that deserves eternal life. I've done everything that deserves eternal punishment, but by God's grace and mercy, He saved me. And He uses us for His glory if we submit our lives to Him. But make sure you know where you're going. He wants you to go to heaven. And that's true for anybody in any different denomination. You know, there's a lot of born-again Catholics. There's a lot of born-again Lutherans. There's a lot of born-again Methodists. There's a lot who aren't. Same in Calvary Chapel. If the rapture were to happen right now, I don't. I would hate to see any of you left behind. I'm sure there will be. Because, you know, I don't know all of you, but make sure you know where you're going. It'd be awesome if this room was emptied, if the rapture happened before I finished this. And at this rate, you're probably thinking you're going to talk until the rapture happens, aren't you? So verse 9 because we're going through another chapter after this, so just a heads up. Here is the mind, verse 9, here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings. This is interesting. Five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. Now, this reference to the seven mountains upon which the woman sits is often referred to as the city of Rome. It's called the city of seven hills. And so some commentators, they go back and forth. Oh, this means Rome. Others will say, well, no, the word for mountains is onos. The word for hill is, what is it? I don't even know what it is. Bunos. It's a different word. And so... Some say this is just a picture of this false religious system, whether it's Rome or not. It's under this guise of a one world religious system. What I think John is seeing here is what Daniel also saw, because Daniel sees seven kings. And, you know, here he says five have fallen. So put yourself in John's sandals at this moment. So there's been five kingdoms or empires in John's day that had fallen. You, you have the uh, Assyrians, you have the Egyptians, you have the, the Babylonians, you have the Medo-Persians, and you have the Greek Empire. They have fallen. Now he says one is. So who's the one is in John's day? The Roman Empire. And then he says there'll one be after that. Well, after that, it will be the one that the Antichrist will rule and reign over. We'll look at it in a moment. The book of Daniel says that one that's coming afterwards is a revived Roman Empire. So remember when Nebuchadnezzar has the vision, he sees the gold head, and Daniel gives the interpretation. Well, that's you. You're Babylon. Then he sees the chest of silver. That's the Medo-Persian Empire that's going to replace Babylon. And that happens in the book of Daniel. Then you have the bronze stomach. That's the Greek Empire. They replaced the Medo-Persian Empire. And then you have the two legs of iron, which replaced the Greek Empire. That's the Roman Empire. And then he says, in the last days, there's going to be ten toes of iron mingled with clay. Anytime you see iron, it refers to the Roman Empire. So you have a revived Roman Empire symbolized by the ten toes in this statue. And then Daniel sees this mountain not cut with hands. And this mountain hits the statue, turns it all to dust, and that mountain takes over the whole world, and that's the Messiah. That's Jesus that is coming. 
So that's what Daniel witnesses. He sees that whole thing. So here, when John looks at this, he sees, okay, there's one that has not yet come, verse 10, and when he comes, he must continue a short time. That's the revived Roman Empire, which we've already seen is led by the Antichrist. He's the final world ruler. So verse 11 says, The beast that was, that's the Antichrist, and is not, is himself also the eighth, and is of the seven, and is going to perdition. And so just in that nutshell of a verse, the Antichrist is the eighth, and he'll rule over the revived Roman Empire, but then it says that he will go to perdition. We'll see that in chapter 19, because the Antichrist, the false prophet, when Jesus returns, they're the first ones that he throws into the lake of fire. Verse 12, the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. So these kings will be with the beast under his authority. Now look at this verse in Daniel chapter 7. Verses 7 and 8, Daniel says, After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth, again the Romans. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. That's what we're reading about here. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, this was the Antichrist, coming up from among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous or blasphemous words. And we saw that same picture in, Daniel, or in Revelation 13. The Antichrist speaking pompous or blasphemous words. He's cursing the God of heaven, cursing the saints of God. He's cursing the throne of God. And then immediately after Daniel sees the rise of the Antichrist, he watches, it says, The Ancient of Days, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus himself, return to earth and destroy the Antichrist once and for all. Verse 13, These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. And so these other kings, these world rulers will be uh, in complete submission to the Antichrist. They'll give him authority over all their resources, which means he'll be in control of all their military, he'll be in control of all their finances, he'll be in control of all their technology, and it's all going to come under the authority and control of the Antichrist and the false prophet working together. This is where we see the whole world heading towards a one-world economy. We were just down in Arizona this past week, and I spent zero cash because everywhere we went, they would not take cash. Throughout the stadium there, we went to a couple Rockies games. They wouldn't take cash. I mean, everything had to be card. I mean, it's just amazing. Now, it's slowly but surely, you know, getting everybody geared up for a cashless society. And, and that's going to be run by the Antichrist eventually. So, again, Daniel saw this. The Antichrist will become the final world dictator but as verse 10, at the end of verse 10 says, he must continue a short time. The Antichrist only has a seven-year period to rule, and then he comes to an end when Jesus returns. Verse 14, these will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb, this is Jesus, will overcome them, for he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings, and those who are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. I love how matter-of-fact this verse is here because at the Battle of Armageddon that we saw at the end of chapter 16 last week, all the nations are going to be brought to the Valley of Megiddo and they're going to be fighting it out. And when Jesus returns, first to Basra, then to Megiddo, when he returns, they'll turn all their warfare against him. And that's what we see here, but he's just going to wipe them out very quickly, very simply. He's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. Turn real quickly to chapter 19. Just flip over to chapter 19. Look at verse 19, because this is what we'll see, this picture of them fighting against the Lamb. It's really no battle at all, because Jesus will wipe them out just with the sword of the that comes from his mouth, the Word of God. It says, And I saw the beast. Who's that? Antichrist. 
the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him, that's the lamb, Jesus, who sat on the horse and against his army. We'll see that's you and me coming back with Jesus at his second coming. Then the beast, the Antichrist, was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And so that's they'll be the end of the Antichrist. They're the first two, the Antichrist false prophet, are the first two to get thrown into the lake of fire. And then a thousand years later, Satan will be released from the, the abyss and he'll be thrown into the lake of fire along with all those who've rebelled against the Lord. So that's what we'll see in the near future here. Now, Jesus Christ is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords, as it mentions here. No one can come against him. That's why... It's always important for you to stay close to Jesus. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Amen? He'll never leave you nor forsake you. He's with you always to the end of this age. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear because he, the Lord, is with me. And so we know he, we have victory because we are in Christ. So verse 15, Then he said to me, The waters which you saw... We already look at this verse where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot. That's the woman riding the beast. Make her desolate and naked. Eat her flesh and burn her with fire. It's another one of those happy, happy, joy, joy chapters. For God has put it into their hearts. No, it's interesting. God puts it into the heart of the Antichrist and these wicked kings to turn against this false religious system and destroy them. No, God has put it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman whom you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. And so, again, some will look at this and say, that's Rome. And so that's the, the Roman Catholic Church, this woman. Yes and no, because this is the what's left of the groups who are left behind. Everybody on earth are going to come together under this one world religion. It doesn't matter who it is. If it is under the Pope, so be it. But they're all coming under one world religion because the true believers, again, from every tribe, tongue, nation, people, every denomination that are born again are out of here. So what's left is just going to be nasty in the eyes of the Lord. So that's chapter 17. deals with God's destruction of this false religious system. Chapter 18 deals with this false destruction of God of this Babylonian commercial, political, materialistic system that's in the world today. And this is pretty heavy duty. Here's a great verse to rem remember as we go through this. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. It says, Do not love the world. And Babylon is often used as a symbol of the world. And so don't love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, and, and this is really what Babylon is all about, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. So look at verse 1 here in chapter 18. After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. Again, this is what we saw back in chapter 14, verse 8. But now we're given you know, more details about it. It has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. 
The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. Heavy duty. So God pours out his wrath against those who have gained their wealth, who have used their wealth by exploiting the people of this world, especially the poor people of this world. Paul says this in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. He gives a strong warning to Timothy and to us. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For notice, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Money's not the root of anything. It's like a knife. A knife can be used for good. It can be used for destruction. Money can be used for good. It can be used for destruction. So money isn't either good or bad. It's the love of money, it says here, where you lust for it. That is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So keep that in mind. Look at verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Worldliness, materialism, can choke out the word of God. Remember the parable of the sower? Jesus says the sower goes out, sows the seed, some falls on the Hard packed soil, the enemy takes it. Some falls in the shallow soil, it springs up. As soon as the sun comes out, it withers. Some fall in the soil and it grows up with the weeds. And what does it say? The weeds choke out the word of God. And that's the picture we see here. The weeds will choke out the word of God, the, the, the love of the riches. Jesus refers to the riches that people have that desire for. The, the, you know, there's no saying money is a great servant, but it makes a horrible master. If, mo if, you, if you're in control of your money, that's good. If money has control over you, that's bad. And that's the distinction you need to keep in mind. Verse 6. It says, render to her just as she rendered to you and repay her double according to her works in the cup which is mixed, mixed double for her in the measure that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously in the same measure give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I sit as queen and am no widow and will not see sorrow. Therefore her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. I mean, this is the lie behind wealth. You know, in pride, people think money is the answer to all of their problems. Money will make me happy. You know, most of the, the, the most miserable people in the world live in Hollywood. I mean, suicide rate is huge in Hollywood because they get the fame, they get the fortune, and it doesn't satisfy because those things won't satisfy. It's deceptive. They think, oh, if I just have enough money, I'll always be safe. I'll always have health. No, we see that it's all going to burn here. And this is why I always say don't put your hope in government don't put your hope in your bank account. Don't put your hope in yourself. Put your hope in Jesus. Keep your hope in Jesus. He's our living hope. He is our you know, blessed hope. You know, this is why uh, the Bible tells us over and over again, come out from among them, like we just saw. 2 Corinthians 6, verses 7 and 18 it says, Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean. And I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord. You know, God is not a cosmic killjoy. That's how a lot of people picture. Oh, if there's a God up there, he must just want, you know, smack me upside the head. He just wants me to be miserable and poor and destitute. That's not his desire for you. 
He loves you. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. He's given us all that we need for life and godliness. And, but he knows what's best for us, too. You know, I could pray all I want for that beach house in Maui. And guess what? God said, no, I'm not going to give that to you because he knows my heart would just go crazy. I'd do stupid things. Yeah, I could move to Maui, live in it. Oh, thank you, God. And then pretty soon I'm just forsaking the Lord. So I spent all my time surfing. You know, by now I can't surf. So then what? You know, you realize all that stuff, it doesn't help. It doesn't do any good. This is why Jesus tells us in Matthew 16, verse 26, for what profit is it a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? I mean, how sad it is when people think that money and success and fame is the essence of happiness and satisfaction in this life, but it doesn't satisfy you know, it's just crazy. People kill, and we'll see that in a moment, they kill for riches. They, they, they'll they sell their soul and sell other people's souls so they can become rich and wealthy. And it leads to destruction every time. Now, what does it profit a man to gain if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? I mean, I think of these multi-billionaires, you know, and it's never enough. And you think of these guys like Bill Gates, you know, you think of the Davos, Switzerland. They had this big retreat a couple months ago now. And all these shakers, movers in the world are there. They're all flying in hundreds of private jets. Some of those private jets flew 13 miles to get from there to Davos. And then they're there talking about how we need to bring the population down under a billion people for Mother Earth to survive. And my reaction is always, well, you first, dude. Come on. I mean, it makes no sense, but they have all this wealth and they want to control people. They want to manipulate things. It's so sad. And, you know, just talking about last night with my brother-in-law that, you know, California, I mean, how nuts are they? We want to give every black person in California $5 million. And then you find the, the black leaders in California saying, that's not enough. And I'm like, what? $5 million? So we're going to go back to California, identify as black. So why not? I mean, if you can identify there as anything you want to be, well, what's the problem then? So I want my five. I mean, where do you stop? You know, it's, it's known fact that slavery ended 160 plus years ago, okay? It's a known fact that almost all the slaves we had brought here and down in South America, primarily Brazil, and these European countries, they were blacks who were sold by their fellow blacks who happened to be Muslim. Black Muslims in Africa were scooping up, rounding up their fellow black tribal leaders that were, refused to become Muslims. They'd round them up, they'd sell them to the whites for slaves. So do you go back to Africa and say, well, we want $5 million for you guys, from you guys. I mean, where does it end? Do the Jews go back to Egypt and say, hey, we were here for 430 years. Where's our, you know, restoration, retribution? I mean, it's just nuts. There, there's no limit to mankind's stupidity. You can have $5 million. What's it going to do? Without Jesus, you can gain the whole world. But without the Lord, you're going to lose your soul. This is what John chapter 4, verses 13 and 14 says. This is where Jesus runs into this very unhappy, unsatisfied, unfulfilled widow or woman at the well. She'd been married five times, living with a guy that's not her husband. And Jesus said to her, he answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. He's speaking of the well water. If you drink of the things of this world, you're going to be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him, will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. That's the good news. You come to Jesus, he'll satisfy your thirsty soul. You don't have to look around at anything else, anywhere else, but you'll find what you need in Jesus. He will satisfy your thirsty soul. Where am I? Um, 
Verse 8, or 9, there we go. <laughs> the kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her will weep and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come. And so whatever this judgment is, however it comes, it will be complete, it will be devastating, it will be terrifying, it will be in so intensely hot, it says people will stand at a distance. Um, it will happen quickly. Remember when the Twin Towers were hit, how quickly those towers fell once you know fire heated up from those planes and the jet fuel and they just collapsed. Well, we saw back in chapter, where is it? 16 verse 19 during the great tribulation it says now the great city was divided into three parts and the cities of the nations fell the cities of the nations fell not just one city the cities of the nations so every skyscraper is going to come down during this time frame and great babylon was remembered before god to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath and that's what we're seeing here. So every city will come down. Verse 11. And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her, for no one buys their merchandise anymore. Merchandise of gold and silver. Again, how many people have been slaughtered because I want your gold? <laughs> You know, when the conquistadors came over to South America and Central America, how many, you know, Aztecs and Mayans, you know, were destroyed because of the gold? And maybe it's under the Mount Rushmore. No, just kidding. It's not. Um, it was a pretty good movie. Anyway, merchandise of gold and silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen and purple, silk and scarlet. He's just giving us all these different things that, you know, reflect having wealth. Every kind of citron wood, every kind of object of ivory, every kind of object of most precious wood, bronze, iron, and marble, and cinnamon, and incense, fragrant oil, and frankincense, wine, and oil, fine flour, and wheat. Again, nothing wrong with this. It's when people buy and sell and trade and rip off people to get these things. That's the point that he's making here. We'll see it in a second. Fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots, and the bodies and souls of men. This is brutal. I mean, this is horrendous. This system is so corrupt that selling the bodies of people, the souls of people, it's commonplace. How could people do this? Well, do we see it today? Absolutely. Trafficking human beings, it's happening all over the world. It's happening at our southern border. It's happening in Thailand. They're selling, they're, they're you know, Buying these little girls from families. They can't afford to do anything else. So they'll sell their little girl to these guys. They'll, they'll take them to Thailand. They'll take them to other places just so they can sell them, use them. And a lot of people in America will go there just to use these kids. I mean, it happens all over the world. It's brutal. Prostitution. Talk about buying and selling the souls of human beings. God sees it all. We, we're so isolated here in our little bubble of western Colorado, but God sees what's going on. Well, it even happens here. It was a few years ago. I've been reading in the paper over on uh, Horizon Drive, one of the hotels. A couple of girls that were sold. They were brought to a hotel over here on Horizon Drive. They were being used. They were being pimped out by these guys. They got busted. Praise the Lord for that. But it happens all over. God sees these things. It is nasty. It is brutal. That's why God's going to judge this system. Verse 14. The fruit that your soul longed for has gone from you. So they're just longing for all this stuff. And they think, oh, this is good fruit. All the wealth, all the materialism. Trading and buying souls of men and girls and boys and women. This is the fruit we want. They long for these things. And it's all gone, and you shall find them no more at all. Praise the Lord, because this is God's judgment bringing it to an end. 
What should we be longing for? What fruit? Fruit of the Holy Spirit. Of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, of which there is no law that can come against that. Love is a fulfillment of the law. And so we should long for the fruit of the Holy Spirit because you're only going to be satisfied in Jesus Christ, not in the things of this world that are all going to burn. Verse 15. Well, wait a minute, before I go. This is why Jesus says in Matthew 16, 26, For what profit is a man to gain the whole world and loses his own soul, or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? I mean, we just talked about that, but it's so true. I mean, you can gain everything in this world, but if you don't have Jesus, it means zip, zilp, zip. One of those things. Zilch. Nada. Nothing. Zero. I'm rambling. Verse 15. The merchants of these things who became rich by her will stand at a distance for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour such great riches came to nothing. Every shipmaster, all who travel by ship, sailors and all and as many as made trade on the sea stood at a distance and cried out when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What is like this great city? They threw dust on their heads and cried out, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth. For in one hour she is made desolate. In other words, it's not who dies with the most toys that wins. Luke chapter 12, verse 15, Jesus says to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Remember, money is a horrible, you know, master. It's a good servant, but it's a horrible master. Verse 20, Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. So never forget, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. In the end, God wins. Now, we're going to rejoice, and we'll see this in chapter 19 as well. We're going to rejoice not because wicked people are being destroyed. God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God desires to see all men come to repentance. We will be rejoicing in the fact that God's righteous judgments are true, are holy. and God doesn't make a mistake. We'll be rejoicing in His righteousness, not in the death of the wicked. God doesn't take pleasure in this. Verse 21, Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence the great city Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found any more. Now, remember what Jesus said in Mark 9, 42. And we saw these millstones in Capernaum when we were there a couple weeks ago. He says, But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble or sin, it would be better for him to have a millstone if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. So what an image this is. This angel takes this big millstone, tosses it into the ocean, and thus with violence the great city shall be thrown down. Verse 22, The sound of harpists, musicians, flutists, and trumpeters shall not be heard in you anymore. No craftsman of any craft shall be found in you anymore. And the sound of a millstone shall not be heard in you anymore. This is why it's called the Great Tribulation, by the way. This is why this is the end of the age. This is when God is destroying the world. As it's now getting worse and worse. He's going to destroy it. This is not the end, though. It's the end for this world system because when Jesus returns in chapter 19, he's going to set up his kingdom. It's going to be a beautiful kingdom for 1,000 years. It's going to be like the Garden of Eden all over the world. There'll be peace and righteousness and joy for a thousand years. It's going to be glorious. But in the meantime, it's going to be brutal during the last part of the Great Tribulation. 
So none of these things will be found anymore or heard in you anymore. Verse 23, the light of a lamp shall not shine in you anymore. And the voice of bridegroom and bride shall not be heard in you anymore. For your merchants were the great men of the earth. For by your sorcery, the Greek word there is pharmakia, all the nations were deceived. And in her was found the blood of prophets and saints and of all who were slain on the earth. So the bottom line of this chapter is this. It makes no difference how much you have or how little you have. What matters to God is, where is your heart? Is it beating for the things of Jesus, or is it beating for the things of this world? Are you seeking first the kingdom of God? That's good if you are, because Jesus says this in Matthew 6.33, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. In other words, as we keep our eyes in Jesus, we seek to do his will for our lives. We live for him first and foremost. Then we can be assured, as all of us can testify, he'll take care of us. He'll bless us, and he has blessed us tremendously. We of all people are, are most blessed, not just because we live in America. We're blessed because Jesus dwells in us. And he's given us all that pertains to life and godliness. He takes care of us. He watches over us. He, you know, we, we have a roof over our heads. We have food. We have transportation. God has blessed us. In Philippians 4.19, Paul says, And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Not all of our greeds, but all of our needs he'll supply. You know, as God's children, Paul tells us that we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. Peter says that God has given us all things that pertain to life and godly living. As Paul closes out his letter to 1 Timothy, this would be, you know, this would pertain to each one of us as well as Christians living today. 1 Timothy 6, 17 and through 19 he says, command those who are rich in this present age. I would say that's 99% of us in this room compared to much of the world. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty or puffed up, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. It always comes back to put the Lord first and foremost. He'll take care of us, and he's blessed some of us with tremendous wealth. He's blessed others with little wealth, but he's blessed all of us in here with Jesus Christ first and foremost. And he gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good. So if you got money, do good, that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. Elizabeth likes to say, giving is my favorite. And she just has a giving heart. Even if we don't have much, she loves to give storing up for yourselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Proverbs 11.28 says, He who trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like what? Can you say it? Foliage. 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 That's why I wanted you to say it, because I always screw it up. And I heard some of you like, foliage, foliage, yeah. That means you're going to flourish like a branch that is fully loaded with fruit. 